European Union is still trying to finalize its divorce from the United Kingdom. And as a way of preparing for that eventuality, the Union continues to reach out to potential partners, especially in Africa, with a view to deepening socio-political and economic relationships. One of those initiatives has been playing out for a couple of years in Nigeria, where this year alone, the European Union has awarded scholarships to over 90 young Nigerians for various master's degree programs in universities across Europe under its Erasmus Mundus Joint Master Degrees Program. Joining us now from our Rice Abuja studio for greater insight into this uh, particular program is Ambassador Ketio Carlson, European Union Head of Delegation for Nigeria and the Economic Community of West African States. Ambassador Carlson, good morning and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning, good morning everyone, and it's absolutely wonderful to be here this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Well, quickly, um, we're going to have a discussion around the uh, scholarships given to over 90 uh, Nigerians under the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, program. Now, what is uh, Erasmus Plus? What is it about? Uh, when did it all start? And uh, I would like to add to that, what is the difference between Erasmus Plus and Erasmus Mundus? Because I was a bit confused. So if you could uh, uh, just explain what the program is all about and how uh, these 93 Nigerians who are beneficiaries this year, uh, how they were selected. Yes, so first of all, I must say it's absolutely wonderful to be the messenger of good news mm -hmm. at times of so much crisis around the world. And, you know, we see the challenges in terms of livelihood uh, challenges as well. And fundamentally being able at this point of time to send a record high number of Nigerian students to Europe, I think it, it speaks volumes to the partnership that we have between the European Union and, and Nigeria in particular. If you look at 2019, we sent forth 44 students and compared to that this year more than double and uh, now 93 students. Uh, looking at a much wider array of, of, of years from 2004 to 2019, we had a total of 386 Nigerian students. So this year is really out outstanding and it shows that we will not be deterred by the current crisis to give priority to this so ever important partnership that we have uh, with Nigeria. Now the Erasmus program is a program that was established back in, in, in the 80s, in 87 to be exact, and initially mainly to have exchanges of students between the European countries themselves. But adding the Mundus uh, uh, title as well, we reached out to the entire world, uh, understanding just how important it is to make sure that we have not only academic excellence, but also a cultural exchange. You know, the opportunity for Nigerian students and students from uh, all the countries around the world to get acquainted with the European cultures and languages, to meet friends and, you know, future colleagues as well. So if you look at Nigeria's position this year, as a matter of fact, Nigeria is the top country in all of Africa. So there's not a single country in Africa with more students selected. And worldwide, it's up there together with India, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Pakistan, and China as uh, the top six countries to have selected students going to, to Europe. I, I think it's really, I mean, we do so many things as the European Union in, in Nigeria, of course, as, as you will have seen around the, the COVID-19 uh, response and beyond. But I, I always feel genuinely proud when we select and send forth you know, brilliant young uh, Nigerian students going to Europe, you know, they will have a transformative, life-changing experience. There's no doubt about it. And then our hope is, of course, that they will either found jobs, find jobs in, in, in Europe or else, elsewhere, or even better, come back to Nigeria and give a little bit back to uh, the, this beautiful country here as well. Uh, Ambassador, why is it important? Why is this an important uh, program for the EU? And what impact does it have on um, immigration of Nigerians to the EU? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful that you raised this particular issue because we talk so much about irregular migration. And again, you will see in Nigeria and in international news now, you know, the, the, the scenes uh, in, in Moria, in, in, in Greece, where we had one of the camps burning. We Currently, there, there, there are people on vessels in the Mediterranean, uh, you know, many tens of thousands of uh, Nigerians stranded in Libya as well. We know the, the dangers of crossing the desert, of, of crossing the Mediterranean as well. So there's a lot of talk around irregular migration. But quite often we forget to look at the regular migration streams that exist as well. And Erasmus is really one of you know, the top uh, and most excellent examples of that, because this is a genuine opportunity for ordinary Nigerians, you know, uh, based on their merit and capacities and you know, their uh, abilities within their different fields, to go to Europe to uh, achieve that academic uh, excellence to partner with students and universities uh, there, and, and fundamentally to assist creating a better education base all over the world. And frankly, we learn a lot from the Nigerians coming to Europe and, and, and vice versa. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I would not be sitting here today talking to you as, as the ambassador of the European Union, uh, representing some uh, 450 million uh, people from, from my continent, had I not done a similar thing many, many years ago, far too many years ago. But, but I was an exchange student myself. I, 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 I went to Latin America at that point in, in, in time. And, and the takeaways from that, the experience, uh, the development that that gives you is really helping to broaden the shoulders and of course to, to set the stage for uh, contributing to the wider society. So uh, when we look at Erasmus uh, and the exchange student program, we, we do this because we genuinely believe in the importance of having this intercultural exchange. But we also do it because we fundamentally believe it's important to show that there are regular ways of migrating. There are opportunities to study and work in different countries. And we must always recognize the amazing contributions uh, of, of Nigerians in so many different places. Nurses, doctors, lawyers, you know, workers in, in, in all different uh, sectors. And I think this is so important not to forget when we also look at, 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 at the scourge of trafficking in human beings and irregular migration. So my hope is that over time we will see a, a gradual shift where more and more uh, regular migration is taking place, whereas the irregular migration will stop altogether. All right. Uh, when, when you said that you went to Latin America as a result of, you know, movement and things like that, my eyes just glistened. I just feel like saying, come estas. <laughs> but, but, but that's not going to be the trust of my question. My question is going to be about when this started and how is this, you know, going to impact the dynamics between Africa and Europe at this time like this? I know the EU has been doing a lot, you know, but Africa and Europe at a time like this, where there's a need for more trading partners and there's a need for more integration. So I think everybody in Europe has perfectly understood the importance of Africa and our relations. Um, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, has put Africa at the very top of the priority list. Uh, if we look at our vice president, Borrell, he has mentioned how Africa is uh, not only a, a sister continent, it, it, it's family uh, to us. We are neighbors uh, by the end of the day. So uh, finding ways of partnering with Africa is absolutely uh, vital. If we look at uh, the demographics as well in Nigeria and beyond, we will see the population growth in Africa uh, already ongoing. And if we get and Nigeria, right, there is an opportunity to get Africa right as well. I mean, the sheer size of this wonderful country is such that Nigeria must be a major priority for the European Union, and it is. And of course, an Erasmus student program is just one component of so many in our engagement with Nigeria. We work with what we like to call an integrated or comprehensive approach. <clears throat> so we work uh, on political issues together. 
Now we are preparing for the next EU AU summit, and you know, there's not a single day where we are not in contact with our Nigerian counterparts here, having you know a very good and healthy dialogue around how can we keep promoting our common values. You know, having democracy, having human rights, uh, making sure that there are opportunities for all, having a greener, more digitalized, uh, climate-friendly economy in our countries, these sorts of things. So that political dialogue is ongoing every single day at all levels. And at the same time, of course, we continue to partner as development partners as well. And, and the European Union remains, uh, together with the member states, the, the, the largest provider of development cooperation in Africa and in Nigeria. Um, you know, in all the different states of, of this country, having activities, supporting the policies and the visions of, uh, of the government here, of the civil society and of the people creating new opportunities. But understanding, of course, that we cannot solve all the issues with development cooperation. We can support some best practices, we can exchange technologies, we, we, we can uh, help each other in that sense. But, you know, by the end of the day, it's all about supporting a, a Nigerian-led effort. So political dialogue, development cooperation, and then, of course, trade and investment. The European Union remains by far the biggest trading partner for Nigeria. Around half of all exports from Nigeria are destined for for, for, for Europe, um, but we would like to see that moving uh, solidly beyond uh, oil that currently dominates that uh, trading partnership, seeing a diversification of the economy and bringing in more investors from Europe as well. You know, when I see that Nigeria is the largest importer in the world of tomato paste, uh, whilst at the same time having some of the best conditions in the world for growing tomato. There's, there's something uh, that, that is fundamentally wrong here. And if we can bring European investors with their knowledge and you know, having them engaging in Kaduna State and in Kano State and in Kebi and in other places, then it's a win-win situation because, of course, this creates jobs and opportunities in Nigeria, but it creates business and opportunities for Europe as well. So this is the comprehensive approach that we want to see. You know, political dialogue, development engagement, working on trade and investment. And as part of that, these sorts of flagship initi initiatives like the uh, Erasmus Mundus program is really uh, assisting in fomenting and cementing and, and, you know, a wonderful symbol of that much wider partnership that we have. Ambassador Carlson, I mean, uh, many young Nigerians listening to you I'm sure would like to know, one, um, how can someone apply? And when you say it's for young Nigerians, uh, what's the uh, bracket? And then three, uh, what is the criteria? Or rather, what are the criteria for the selection of, uh, uh, of uh, beneficiaries? And then the program is titled Erasmus Plus 2014 to 2020. Is there any hope of an extension beyond uh, the year 2020? Yes, so the extension is, is already there. We are not going to abandon this program. Um, look out, watch out for the announcement of the next round. Normally, it's coming around October. What we do is that we always active, I mean, we put it on our own web pages, of course, so look out for the EU in, in, in Nigeria. But we also send the information to all the universities. We are in direct dialogue with the vice chancellors of the different universities in Nigeria. And of course, we are reaching out to youth organizations as well. When we did an event a few days ago for the 93 selected students this year, we invited uh, members of the National Youth Corp to join us. So we did not do a closed ceremony for you know, the selected few. We actually had literally thousands, more than 6,000 uh, members of the National Youth Corp uh, joining us virtually in the room as well. And I think having that access to information about this opportunity, and hopefully your program this morning as well will help, will only increase the base of those that uh, apply. And by that, we will see more selected as well. Now, the selection is based sheerly and merely on merit. 
So there is no uh, political decision making. I have nothing to do with selecting the students myself. This is done uh, strictly uh, between the universities involved in, in, in Europe and based on very strict uh, criteria on, on, on the capacity and academic excellence of the students that apply. It's, it's a program that caters for all different levels and age groups in the sense that there are uh, um, lecturers, that uh, researchers that can uh, uh, get scholarships as well, you know, students at master level and so forth. So really just look out for this, Google it or watch it on, on the internet and you will see all the opportunities uh, there. And then my hope is that, you know, next year we will see even more uh, Nigerians selected for this, uh, for this wonderful program. Mm. Uh, what else is the EU doing to help young Nigerians? Would you like to share with us? Well, there, there I have to ask you how many hours we have to respond to that <laughs> question, because frankly, we are doing quite a lot. You know, the, 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 the fact is that we, are, we, we have understood that 60% of the population or more in Nigeria are young people. Um, we know that that percentage is only going to grow in the future. So every single thing that is being done will only be successful if it caters for the needs of the young Nigerians, you know, creating more opportunities. So when we work on a democratic inclusivity, when we engage on electoral processes, like we are now doing in preparation for the polls in, in, in Edo State and, and Ondo State, for instance. But beyond that, you know, since 1999, having uh, invested more than 100 million euros in, in, in multiple, multiple uh, programs on this, we make sure that uh, the youth is a cross-cutting uh, priority. Uh, the, supporting the not too young to run uh, bill when that was uh, created and the implementation afterwards, supporting Yaga in the work that they are doing now in, in, in Edo State, uh, doing campaigns of, uh, you know, moving around the country. I went to the six geopolitical zones myself to talk to thousands of young people together with the INEC chairman ahead of the elections in 2019 to get as many young voters and, and politicians to participate as, as possible. When we work on promoting a, a stronger economy in Nigeria and we identify uh, value chains such as uh, tomato, ginger, leather, uh, you know, fashion, uh, digital industries, uh, uh, sustainable power supply, etc. We always make sure that there is a youth component in that as well. When we support education and access to basic social services, this is only meaningful if at the same time we have a strong youth component. Uh, alone for the reason of the sheer volume and size of the youth population in, in, in Nigeria, but also because that we, we, we understand as Europe that the stability and having a prosperous Nigeria uh, in, 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 in the medium to long term is a European interest as well. I mean, what is good for Nigeria is good for the European Union as well. And it's only to the extent that we address the root causes, you know, the shortcoming in terms of access to jobs and opportunities, you know, beyond day-to-day uh, -day informal sector uh, work. It's only to the extent that we cater for that, that we will have a, a stable and prosperous Nigeria in the medium to long term. Again, taking into consideration, you know, the foreseen massive population growth in this country and already, of course, seeing uh, some uh, conflicts and, and, and violence, uh, pockets of violence around the country. Um, if we do not address those root causes and create opportunities for youth, then I fear that we would only see more of that in the future. And that is not in the interest, of course, of Nigeria, but it's not in the interest of the European Union uh, either. So, uh, in, 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 in essence, I, I, I tried not to spend hours in answering okay. your question, okay. but in everything we do, there is a component related to youth. Right, right. Uh, Vassilo, I'd like to uh, talk to you about uh, Brexit, EU and the you know, UK negotiations. I mean, how far is that? You know, what are the issues like? Uh, uh, let's just share, because a lot of us in Nigeria, too, we are concerned, you know, about what's happening in Brexit. So, it's like it happens at our backyard here. Uh, what, what, what's, what, what are the issues, the, the current crisis with the UK? 
Yes, well, uh, I think there's a bit of Brexit fatigue with all of us. You know, the, the, the conversation around Brexit has taken place for, for such a, a long time. Now we are, we are today on the 11th of, of, of September and, you know, uh, the, the heinous attacks we saw, uh, you know, back, 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 back then uh, uh, com com comes to mind and there's certain you know events in history where you will never forget you know where you were physically seated when you received the 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 information and certainly 911 9 is one of them and you know I will not compare the loss of human life to 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 to, to brexit but uh, but I vividly remember exactly you know where I was seated in uh, in my living room when I got the news of of the outcome of the referendum in in the UK and that's already uh, years ago and of course there's an ongoing negotiation again uh, we are drawing closer to uh, yet another uh, deadline um, uh, very intense uh, negotiations go, going on. You will have seen the expressions of concern from my senior leadership in, in, in Brussels uh, over, uh, uh, you know, s some, some suggestions that uh, the uh, initial ag agreement uh, does not need to be uh, followed uh, by, by the letter. Uh, of course, the uh, um, credibility of, of international negotiations depend entirely on, you know, the full implementation of what has been been agreed. But uh, hopefully, we will still be able to manage having, you know, an, an, an outcome here that will benefit uh, both populations in, in the UK and in, in the European Union. And then, from a Nigeria perspective, I must say that we have never stopped partnering with uh, the UK. Uh, there is not a day here where we are not uh, sharing notes or, you know, engaging together on a number of different issues. We have a shared agenda to a very large extent and a wonderful collaboration on on the, on the ground. Uh, a lot of the initiatives that we support here are also supported by the British government, and you know it doesn't make sense to operate in silos. So we will continue partnering and 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 working together. And frankly, I don't see it as a competition as such when it comes to having access to uh, markets and investment and trade opportunities in Africa and Nigeria. You know, the potential here is just so immense that uh, there is space enough uh, for everyone. On, on, on the contrary, I think it's for everyone to look at ways of engaging more, investing more, you know, making sure that there is a conducive environment for, for, for doing that, because that is the only way that we can build as well the economy of uh, the future of Nigeria, and that's in the interest of the European Union. I'm sure it's in the interest of the United Kingdom as well. So I'm optimistic that that partnership will only be strengthened in the year to, years to come. Ambassador Carlson, um, very early uh, in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, matter, uh, the European Union was one of the uh, first to provide support for Nigeria with about uh, 50 million euros as a grant. Uh, would you like to talk a bit about that and the support that the EU uh, is giving to not just Nigeria, but other uh, middle-income uh, countries? Yes, Th thank you for raising that question. And I, I think if, I, I, if I'm ever gonna write my memoirs, there will be a chapter on, 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 on that engagement because very early on, uh, we uh, heard from uh, President Buhari, we heard from the presidential task force or what was going to become the presidential task force and from civil society and, and, and a lot of Nigerians, you know, the, the, the request for support uh, as this uh, scourge of the COVID-19 crisis was coming to Nigeria. And I, I still kept at home the, the, the this this day newspaper front page when the when the first case was was discovered in in, in Nigeria now more than than half a year ago, and and we mobilized very rapidly. I I, I mean I think probably more rapidly than ever seen before. Um, we mobilized a massive support from the European Union, you know, uh, taking. Uh, out uh, 50 million euros at a point in time where the crisis was immense in Europe uh, uh, as well. And frankly, you know, our own countries were struggling uh, with fighting this uh, pandemic because we understood the importance of showing solidarity and partnering with Africa. And again, like my vice president said at that point in time, you know, if, 
if we don't deal with this uh, pandemic in Africa, if it's not uh, addressed in Africa, then we will not be in a position to solve this matter altogether. So we reached out to our partners in the multilateral system and, and to the UN in Nigeria in particular. And I must say that the UN really delivered. In record time, they established a basket fund, a one UN basket fund. And we were able to channel the funding there very swiftly, um, you know, uh, purchase on the international market the things that were most needed, testing, uh, you know, equipment, um, uh, you know, all the different uh, equipment needed for the health sector as well, and, and bringing that in uh, swiftly to Nigeria. And I just took a fresh look this morning, you know, now all of this has been distributed to all 36 states uh, in Nigeria. This is one of the reasons that now there is a testing capacity uh, like we see now 12, 15,000 uh, tests available per, 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 per day in Nigeria, quite, quite significant. So we really genuinely contributed there. And I, I, I think it's a time of crisis that you get to see who your tr true friends and partners are by the end of the day. And I'm, I'm really genuinely proud and happy that we have demonstrated uh, you know, that at this point in time when really needed, you know, we stepped up to the challenge from the European Union and, 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 and supported uh, Nigeria, you know, providing as well uh, food items, uh, you know, basic items to those most, most in need, to people with disability, you know, working with the authorities, with civil society to try to, uh, you know, overcome this horrendous challenge on the pandemic within the pandemic with sexual and gender-based violence that we have seen. I mean, these rape cases, these murder cases, you know, the, the, that we have seen around, around the country, trying to find solutions there, availing shelters, availing, uh, you know, better access to uh, uh, sexual assault referral centers. And the list goes on and on. NAPTIP, we supported NAPTIP. The National Police, we supported the National Police, and so forth and so forth. So, so genuinely, we have turned every single stone out there, you know, looking at our existing programs as well and seeing, you know, what can be done to support Nigeria in this effort. And, you know, we, we, we pray that um, we will see continuous uh, declining numbers and that we will soon be, be able to, to uh, overcome fundamentally this crisis. But the storm is not uh, over yet. Uh, by the way, as well, making sure that the Northeast you know, where already you have such uh, immense numbers of IDPs and, you know, a conflict that is already such a daunting challenge, you know, adding additional support there. Our humanitarian agency, ECHO, availed 17.5 million euros in additional support for food security, for water and sanitation in the Northeast because of the COVID-19 crisis. So genuinely, I feel that, you know, we have never before seen such a genuine partnership between the European Union and, and Nigeria before. We call it Team Europe yeah. because it's not only the EU and it's not only me and the delegation, it's also our member states. There are 19 member states present here in, in Nigeria, in Abuja, in Lagos as well, and they have all done an, an immense job to make sure that we support to our best ability. Well said, Ambassador. But despite this efforts, contributions and commendation for the Nigerian government, how it has handled the COVID-19 crisis, many Nigerians were surprised to see that Nigeria made it to that list, uh, black, blacklisting, blacklisting Nigerians from traveling to uh, Europe. Uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. I wonder what you have to say to that. But let me also add on the trade relations matter. Uh, you said, and we do agree, uh, we are one of the largest partners, trading partners, the EU and Europe in general with Nigeria. But uh, beyond oil, can we really say that for other commodities, for instance, agriculture, what's happening? Would you say trade relations are at their best uh, between these trading partners, Nigeria and the EU and Europe in general? 
Well, ec excellent questions as well. And, and on the flight situation, I'm really happy that you raised this, actually, because there are some misunderstandings uh, uh, around the notion that there should be a blacklisting of Nigerians. That is not at all uh, the, the, the case. And I think, you know, some have used uh, words like reciprocity and retaliation even. Uh, and, and the only th uh, thing that is there is that the European Union, just like Nigeria, has uh, made some protocols on how to travel into the European Union and what are the categories of people that can travel. Uh, for a very extended point of time, Nigeria as well on, only had extraordinary travel to Nigeria, you know, diplomats, essential staff, people that really needed to come here. And it's exactly the same uh, in the case of the European Union. So there's no difference uh, fundamentally between the way that, you know, Europeans have been able to travel to Nigeria and Nigerians to, to Europe. And, and, and I can say there's not a single aeroplane that has been banned uh, to travel from Nigeria to, to the European Union. Uh, so so th this notion that there should be, you know, some sort of uh, blacklisting uh, or, or banning of, of Nigerian uh, flights, is, is, it's simply not uh, correct. Uh, but we are happy to see that, uh, you know, uh, this cautious approach of now uh, having uh, flights operating again, commercial flights, of course, we are, we are hopeful to see as well as soon as possible that more flights from the EU can go to Nigeria because this is so important for having, you know, the um, economic, uh, the, uh, the machine operating again. And it needs to be done in a cautious manner. I think the presidential task force here has, has done uh, very well in terms of ide identifying you know, the necessary precautions, you know, testing before you leave, going into isolation after seven days, testing again, and only if negative should you come out of isolation. You know, I was in Europe myself and came back three weeks ago, and I was in strict self-isolation and didn't see anyone for, for, for two full weeks. This is part of my responsibility uh, as a citizen as well. And if everybody adheres to those rules and guidelines, then I'm sure that, you know, we can see even more flights operating between uh, Europe and, and, and Nigeria as, as well. I do believe that the uh, Nigerian government and the authorities have, you know, managed the situation quite well. Um, it's very early establishment of the presidential task force, you know, having the architecture in place, of course, appealing to the governors to take the necessary decisions. I'm, I'm not envious on the uh, politicians and decision makers at the, the times of crisis. They need to take very, very tough decisions. I mean, the implications for ordinary people are very significant. Now we see the, 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 the prices going up, up on, on, on uh, fuel, on electricity. Uh, we see the impact on, on livelihood opportunities, especially for, for, for the poor. You know, uh, quite often it, it, it's the most vulnerable and the poorest that are, that are the heaviest impacted and impacted for the longest time. So I, I'm sure that none of the decision makers have taken these decisions lightly, but, but uh, fundamentally I think that a, a lot of uh, courageous and important and necessary decisions have, have been taken. You know, attribution uh, on a pandemic is very difficult to tell. I mean, if we had decided this, would that have impacted so or, or the other way around? It's very difficult to tell, but I'm certain that, you know, had the Nigerian government not been as strict as has been the case, then we would have been in a completely different situation as of today. And then finally, your question on, on, on trade and, and investment and whether we are at a best sort of scenario when it comes to, to beyond oil and, you know, agriculture. I mean, certainly not. We, we, there's so much more that can, can, can be done. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, sometimes having access to uh, oil or, or, or minerals or diamonds in some ca cases can be a blessing in disguise because it tends to undermine historically you know, the continuation of uh, efficient production in other sectors, uh, simply because there's uh, too easy access to, to, to foreign uh, uh, currency through, through sell, 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 selling oil. And I think agriculture is a case in point where in Nigeria the sector has suffered. I, I am aware that internally, of course, in the, in the country, agriculture is, is a vital provider of jobs and, you know, by far the biggest sector in the, the economy, but much more can be done. 
And I think there is a huge uh, unexplored potential to uh, have more agricultural uh, exports, uh, including to Europe as well. And, and that is why we, we try to identify value chains. I mean, the commodities and pr uh, products that have a potential for, 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 for a very, you know, lucrative, potentially lucrative and well-paying market, you know, with 450 million plus consumers willing to pay a good price for good products in, in, in Europe. And there again, we, we, we have seen, uh, you know, tomato, ginger, uh, leather, uh, fashion, uh, you know, some of the digital products in Nigeria, um, sustainable energy production, etc. There are plenty of opportunities, but they, we need to be better at, at tapping into them. And of course, it takes a comprehensive approach where also uh, a training, vocational training, education, is provided where there is the, the legal certainty that you know investments are protected uh, and of course the security situation of course is part of the equation as well so we do need a comprehensive approach to increase the conducive environment for more investments but then i'm certain that we will also see more trade beyond oil between the European Union and Nigeria in the years to come. Right. Uh, real quickly, Ambassador, I just want to talk about still trade, but for small businesses now. We've got close to 40 million small businesses in Nigeria. The Americans have something called AGOA, a, a, a Growth and Opportunity Act, where it's easier for people to be able to, you know, uh, send products to America without even paying any tariff at all, and that was extended recently. Is the EU going to do something like that, or do you have a framework like that? And secondly, I want to know what the EU is, good, good, is doing about gender-based violence. I mean, is there any new thing on the cards as regards data and processing of gender-based violence and, and reportage? Yes, so on, on, on the first question, indeed, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises are such a vital part of the economy uh, everywhere. I mean, that's the case in Europe as well. That's largely how, you know, a lot of our countries are building their economies. That, that is what is sustaining, you know, export. This is really where we have the big, you know, drivers of change within the, the innovation as well within the economies. So, so this is already a very significant factor in Nigeria, but should be even more so. Now, in terms of their access to European markets, I, I, this is exactly the spirit of the economic partnership agreement that was uh, negotiated and agreed, agreed with ECOWAS some uh, years ago, but where uh, Nigeria has still not uh, opted for for, for, for signing the final a, a agreement, um, probably being uh, concerned about the exposure to competition. But I think with the inbuilt um, uh, uh, preferences that are given to Nigerian businesses, if really thoroughly studied, I think people would reach the conclusion that this would be a huge advantage for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises uh, in Nigeria. But whether we have a, an economic partnership agreement in full implementation or not, we are not sleeping on the laurels here. You know, we are engaging, we are having business-to-business -business contacts. Uh, we have programs in Europe supporting the development of, of small and medium-sized enterprises in Nigeria as well. So there's a lot going on there and a lot of potential. Now, on, on sexual and gender-based violence, and this is a very different issue, of course, altogether, this is a vital priority. We have um, uh, appealed to all the decision makers here to really uh, uh, address this emergency. It's great to see that the Governor's Forum decided to call uh, an emergency on this issue. Uh, President Buhari uh, uh, kindly spoke out on this issue when we hosted, uh, together with the United Nations and our joint spotlight initiative, he spoke out on the issue of gender-based violence, you know, signaling that this is such an important uh, priority. I think the outcry that we have seen from about everyone in Nigeria. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely concerned opening the newspaper in the morning uh, to see what kind of stories I, I, I will see in terms of, of, of violence against women and girls and, and sometimes boys as well. Uh, but the EU is doing a lot. We, we have supported the 16 current sexual assault referral centers in different states of the country. More coming. We are supporting shelters. You know, we supported uh, the creation of the National Register for Sexual Offenders. And, and with the Spotlight Initiative, 
you know, this flagship major initiative uh, together with the United Nations, together with the key partners in government, you know, we are bridging between doing actual things on the ground. I mean, supporting real action on the ground and then at the same time having a policy dialogue because these matters can only be solved if they are made a priority by those that take the decisions at the highest political level. You know, for governors to say, I will not only domesticate the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act or the Child Rights Act, I will not only domesticate it, I will also implement it. You know, I want to be elected or maybe re-elected for being a champion uh, in the fight against uh, sexual and gender-based violence. This is what we want to see from the politicians, also at federal level, uh, of, of, of course. And, and, you know, making sure that what can be done swiftly is done swiftly as well. Making sure that there's not a single state in this country where there are not available sexual assault referral centers, where these poor victims can go and be treated properly, you know, receive uh, uh, medical care, but also uh, receive legal advice, um, have access to justice uh, through the uh, um, uh, law and enforcement, uh, the police. I mean, it's only when everybody comes together and the institutions deliver all hands on deck that we will be able to fundamentally fight this scourge. But on the positive side, you know, at least now it's out there in the public domain. There's a genuine dialogue around this particular matter. And that gives me hope that we can also see some genuine, real changes. Well, Ambassador Carlson, we started with uh, Erasmus Plus. Let's close with that. <clears throat> I asked you um, earlier what the uh, selection criteria are. And you said, well, merit is the main criteria. But <clears throat> I am aware that you have uh, a bridging the gender gap program in Nigeria. Uh, bridging the gender gap, is this one of the considerations in the selection of uh, candidates for the Erasmus Plus uh, uh, program. What is the percentage in terms of uh, gender? Or is it just an open-ended thing? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's great to end on such a positive note. And, uh, it, you know, after having covered uh, so much ground, and of course, there are, you know, hundreds of things that we are doing in Nigeria that we cannot discuss in, in, in a brief morning program like, like this one. But uh, let's by all means end on this very wonderful note, again, reminding us, you know, that a record number of Nigerians have been selected to, to go to Europe. A very significant proportion of those are, are women. They, there's not a threshold established as such, but there is a very concerted effort to make sure that as many women participate as possible. By the way, to make sure as well that we have a geographical uh, spreading this year, we have participants from five out of the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria. I want all six of them to be there uh, next year. Um, the program itself gives priority to um, um, students coming from poor background, uh, from uh, more vulnerable conditions, and, and, and to women as well, to facilitate sometimes a slightly easier access to the program as well, because we want to have inclusivity. We want to make sure that, you know, uh, as many as possible can, can, can participate. And then it's really an attractive program by the end of the day, and that's why I'm also certain it will be a life-changing experience. I mean, all of these people are not only going to one country and one university, they are going to several countries and several university, universities, some of them two, some of them, are of them three. They will be provided with a monthly you know, a payment as well. All the costs for travel and accommodation is covered. So it's a quite attractive program. And that's, uh, that's, of course, also why we need to make sure that those that are selected will genuinely represent well Nigeria. They will go there as ambassadors of Nigeria. And then my hope is that they will, you know, either get the fantastic jobs in European businesses or come back to Nigeria and join me as ambassadors of the European Union as in Nigeria coming back here in the end. Thank you very much, Ambassador Katia Carlson. I can assure you that by next year, you will probably get uh, applications running into hundreds of uh, thousands. Thank you very much for this uh, very useful uh, <laughs> engagement.